Hey everybody, I'm John Luke. Welcome in the name of Jesus for this time of worship. It is now the fifth Sunday in Lent and uh, we are in the midst of our Songs of the Heart worship series. We're reading the beautiful poetry from these songs, these psalms, today Psalm 119, and, and we're uh, hearing how important it is to have God's direction, God's teaching, instruction in our lives so we're uh, aligned with God's will. Thanks for joining with us. We'd love to connect with you. A great place to do that is at salemchurch.life. And as always, I encourage you to share this. It's usually as easy as a click to share Jesus with others. Welcome. In the Old Testament, the character Job affirms, I've treasured the words of God's mouth more than food. As God's people, we are nurtured and formed by God's word. Come and listen to what God says and be fed. Lord, let your glory fall. Lord, let your glory fall as on that ancient day. Songs of enduring God.
Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. My name is Simon Campbell, and I'm the Director of Worship and Mission at Marion Methodist Church. And I've been working with your pastor as a part of a preaching team that developed this sermon series, Songs of the Heart, focusing on the Psalms. And this week, we have a chance to look at Psalm 119, and really the opportunity that the Lenten season gives us to reflect on and to evaluate the direction of our lives. And my hope for you this morning is that you'd experience the transforming power of God's word in your life today. Today we're reading a couple of stanzas or sections from Psalm 119. The entire psalm is split into 22 stanzas or, or sections, one for each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So it's Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Daleth, it's like A, B, C, D, E, you know, each section is, is one of those. So it's an alphabetic acrostic psalm. And then each of these 22 stanzas is divided into eight lines or eight verses. And each of those eight poetic lines then begins with the corresponding Hebrew uh, alphabet letter. It, it's really, it's quite a marvel in, in Hebrew. And then furthermore, the psalm is distinguished by the use of eight particular words that that reference God's revelation, God's law, that is God's teaching, God's direction, God's instruction. This entire psalm, it's very long, it's, it's quite repetitive, but that repetition emphatically makes the point that God's instruction, that is God's will, is pervasively and extremely important in the lives of the faithful and indeed of the entire world. We're reading verses 9 to 16, and then 33 through 40. This is Psalm 119. How can young people keep their way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Do not let me stray from your commandments. I treasure your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the ordinances of your mouth. I delight in the way of your decrees as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will observe it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Turn my heart to your decrees and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at vanities. Give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant your promise, which is, which is for those who fear you. Turn away the disgrace that I dread, for your ordinances are good. See, I have longed for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So have you ever gone the wrong direction? Or perhaps we might say, have you ever discovered, have you ever found out that you're going in the wrong direction? When I moved to Evanston, Illinois, um, it's on the north side of Chicago. <clears throat> I moved there to begin seminary back in, uh, what was that, 1991. Long time ago. 
And so I had to move there to go to seminary. My fiancé, my new fiancé at that time, Joy, and my parents helped me make that move. And so we had three vehicles. I had my old 1983 Datsun, and we had the little moving truck, and then my parents had their car. And, and we drove together from Iowa, sort of in a little caravan, out to Chicago, and we stayed together until we hit the freeway in Chicago. And of course, there was a lot more traffic, there was congestion, but, but that wasn't really the problem. The problem was, I, I took the wrong exit. So remember, Evanston, that's where Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary is, it's on the north side of Chicago, and somehow, I took the et- exit for the freeway going south. And I was just going along, having a good old time. I'm moving to Chicago. And I looked out the window, and I saw the stadium for the Chicago White Sox baseball team. And I was like, oh, 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 because I knew they were on the south side of Chicago, and I was driving south. And I panicked, and I thought, oh, my goodness, what in the world? And I was able to get an exit and get turned around and get headed back north. And the amazing thing was this. As I was driving north now on the freeway, I looked out the window and I saw that, that the other two vehicles were, were next to me. Somehow, in, in me going the wrong direction first, God then was able to bring us together on a freeway in Chicago and we were able to arrive together at our destination. Today, of course, we have GPS and navigation, and it'll lead you turn by turn if you just follow along so you get to your destination. But, but what happens if you start out going the wrong way to begin with, or what happens if you make a wrong turn as you're, as you're heading along? Well, have you ever experienced that? If you have that voice navigation, it's so kind. It'll, it'll, it'll correct it for you. It will redirect you. That nice voice calmly says something like, Hey there, okay, you missed that one. I don't know if it says exactly those kinds of things, but, but it probably says something like that. It probably says something like, Hey, okay, you missed the turn, but I'm going to redirect you. I'm going to get you going in the right direction, so, so I'm going to ask you to turn right at the next intersection in a mile, and I'm going to let you know when you're getting close, you need to pay attention and listen to me so I can reroute you, redirect you, get you head in the right direction again. Wouldn't it be great if we had something like that for our own lives, something to, to help get us going in the right direction? So, especially when you get going in the wrong direction in your life, you might have that voice come on and say, hey there, okay, so you kind of messed that up, right? But I'm going to get you going in the right direction. What I need you to do, you know, and you just follow along as you get redirected in life. Of course, we do have something like that, right? We do. We already have that. God's teaching, God's instruction God's will is so important for our lives and for the life of the world. And our song from the heart, Psalm 119, says really the only way to to make sure that you're headed in the right direction is to follow God's teaching, God's instruction, God's direction. It's called the Torah. Of course, there's the Torah, which is the first five books of the Old Testament, as we would see it. Um, that's the law. But, but Torah is also that word that, that means instruction. It means teaching and direction. And that's what we have to focus on so that we might be aligned with God's will for our lives and for the world. This is what happened for the Israelites when they got off course and headed in the wrong direction. So just for a little context, this was about 500 years before the time of Jesus, and the southern kingdom of Israel was conquered, and they were forced into exile, and that that means that they were sort of taken out of their lands, they were pulled out of their homes and their communities, and they were were carried off to, to the land of Babylon. But after the Israelites finally got to return to their homeland, they'd been there quite a while, they'd been there about 100 years, but they still hadn't been able to accomplish much. They were sort of aimlessly wandering, so to speak. Jerusalem had a broken down wall, and that meant that it was an insecure city. It wasn't all that safe. But then Nehemiah arrived as the governor, and he had the authority to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem, to to restore it, make it a fortified city. 
But the enemies did everything that they could in their power to prevent that wall from being rebuilt. But still, Nehemiah the governor was able to lead in such a wonderful way they, they could make it happen. And it was this great moment, and the people began to thrive again, because now they were safe inside the walls of a secure city. And in the seventh month, the people all came together. All the people, the men, the women, all who were able to understand what was going on. And they told Ezra the priest to come and to bring their scriptures the Torah, the Law of Moses, the, the first five books of the Bible. And this is such an important thing. Ezra the priest didn't summon them. The people, they summoned Ezra. They knew. They knew they had to hear the word of God proclaimed. They had to hear what it was that God was saying to them. They knew they'd been wandering aimlessly. They hadn't been going in the right direction. They knew they needed that. The writer Walter Wangeren describes the scene like this, uh, and I love this. Now comes Ezra the priest down from the old palace mount. You can imagine carrying the scrolls in his arms, and he enters the square before the water gate, and he passes through a great congregation of people all seated on the ground. And at the far end, they've constructed this wooden platform. They've built a pulpit, so to speak, for this reading. And Ezra ascends the platform, steps to the front. He unrolls the scrolls. And spontaneously, the people all stand as one. And Ezra, he blesses the Lord. Blessed be the God, the Lord of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. And all the people raised their hands up and, and cried out, Amen, Amen. And then when the people sat back down on the ground again, Ezra the priest begins to read. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. In Genesis chapter 1, at the very beginning of all that is, God spoke. The first chapter of the Bible proclaims, God said, God said, nine times, God said, God said, let there be light, there was light. God said, let the dry land appear, and it was so. God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, and it was so. Merely by speaking, God brought all things into existence. The word of God makes things happen. As an aside, I had a preaching professor who told me once that 500 years ago, Martin Luther said in his commentary on Genesis that the beginning of human preaching was when Adam and Eve told each other what God had told them. And so the people, they asked the old priest Ezra to come and read the word of God. And it's a beautiful moment with God's people because they are who they are only by God's word. And that's how they are able to go in the right direction. And in this case, how they sort of get redirected in life. Ezra read about six hours, but even with that long time, everyone paid close attention. Can you imagine that? Let's ha get together and have church for six hours, and we're going to read the proclamation of God's word, right? But everyone paid close attention, and there were these 13 Levites who with Ezra, they moved through the crowd, making sure that everyone understood what they were hearing, what was being proclaimed, what was being read. And the people, they all began to weep when they heard the scriptures read because they heard from the Lord God. And in hearing from the Lord God, they saw how far their lives had gotten off course, how they were going in the wrong direction. And they, and they wept. They knew that they had been created and redeemed and sustained by the speaking of the Lord God. And they saw that their lives had not been what the word of God proclaimed, and so they wept. But Ezra said, hey, this is a, a holy day, not a time for mourning and weeping. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And, 
and Ezra the priest commanded them to be filled with joy and to eat and to drink and, and to give food to those who were in need because, because they understood all these words of God, the word of God that was proclaimed to them. The next day they continued reading and studying God's word and they discovered something in this hearing. They discovered that it was written that the people of Israel should live in tents during the festival celebration of the seventh month. And guess what? This was the exact time that they found themselves, this time in which Ezra was reading God's word to them. It was the seventh month. So they did exactly what the text said. They went out, all of them, and built tents on their roofs or in their courtyards, and they lived in tents for seven days. And each day they continued reading from the book of the law of God. See, they read the scriptures, they, they, they had God's word proclaimed, and then they embodied that. They did what the word of God instructed them to do. Because that is who we are as God's people. And now as the body of Jesus, we too are the people who begin by this action of taking up the scroll, or in this case now, we have these bound Bibles. We begin with the action of taking up the scroll and being confronted with the stories of God and attempting to form our lives in response to the word of God. You hear that? We are confronted by God's word and we attempt to form our lives, how we live our lives in response to that. And so we could say a, a congregation like Salem is Christian to the degree that we are confronted we are confronted by an attempt to form our life in response to the word of God. And we know there's a lot of clubs and organizations and people who do good things. They do good, and that's awesome. But we're the people who make it a priority to listen to what God says to us. That's who we are. We make it a priority to listen to what God says to us and then form our life around that. And that's why it's so important that we gather. We gather together regularly. Of course, you know, we've been having to gather online for this past year, and so many of us are just longing to be together in person, and it's coming soon. It's coming. But, but, but it's so important for us to gather each week to be confronted by the Word of God, for us to begin by, by lifting up God's word and proclaiming that. And we do that when we gather for worship, whether that's in person or online, but it's so important for us to do that. It's important for us, likewise, to be a part of a smaller group of, of people so that we could talk about how God is confronting us, how God is directing us, how God might be redirecting our lives with God's word. It's so important for us individually even, to be spending time with God daily if possible, reading the Bible, spending time with God that we might be shaped and formed in our lives in the hearing of what God says to us. See, our song from the heart, Psalm 119, he says, it says this is the only way to know that we're headed in the right direction. This is how we know we're headed in the right direction, if we, will, if we will saturate our lives in this Torah, the, the teaching, the instruction, the direction from God, because that's how we are able to have our lives aligned with God's will. We are confronted with God's word and we attempt to form our lives in response. God is speaking. Are we listening? And when we find ourselves headed in the wrong direction, see, God's word has the power to reroute us, to redirect us, to get us all headed in the right direction, to bring us together as one so that we too are able to arrive at our destination together. Take up the scroll. Take up the scroll. A bound Bible the Bible app on a device. Be confronted with the stories of God. Form your life 
in response to God's word because that's who we are. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. First, let us offer honor, love, respect, and awe for who God is. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Next, let us confess our sin and the brokenness of ourselves and this world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now, let us thank God and offer our gratitude for all that God has done in Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now, let us make our request known to God. Let us pray for the church throughout the world and for Salem, that we would continue to form our life in response to the word of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for peace in the world and for those who have been anointed or chosen as leaders of people, that they would attend to the voices of their people and be guided by the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the world, especially for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, for those in prison, for our enemies, for those we dislike, who irritate us and confound us. Let us pray for those in any need or trouble. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for all in the path or wake of the novel coronavirus as the pandemic continues. We pray for an end, for the light at the end of the tunnel to give us hope, for safe, effective, and quick rollouts of the vaccines to stop the spread of this virus and to protect God's children. We pray for protection and strength over hospitals and healthcare workers. And though we are getting closer until this fully ends, help us love our neighbors by wearing masks, washing hands, distancing, and staying out of larger groups until it is safe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for ourselves, our families, and those we love, especially for our brother Bob Jane, who died March 10th and whose funeral service was last week. Please pray for his family and friends, especially his close friend and companion, Linda Dahl. For Bud Carnahan, who had a procedure last week. Dale Bream, who, have been in, who has been in the hospital. And for compassion and understanding for those individuals and families who struggle with mental health issues and chemical dependency. And for Salem's next pastor, Reverend Matt German, as well as for our congregation during this time of transition. May God show us what he is doing and allow us to be a part of it. And let us pray now for those we lift up to the Lord silently in our hearts and minds, and for those we lift up aloud with our voices. mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever, and who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. Thanks for gathering with us for worship. As I mentioned in my sermon, I, I hope you have some smaller group uh, opportunity to be discussing how, how it is that God's confronting you with God's word and how God might be directing you uh, or redirecting you and, and all of us together. So we do have small group material available for that. Just let us know. We'd love to share that with you. Today is the third Sunday of the month, and that means that I will be offering online Holy Communion and uh, I'll be doing that as a, a Facebook Live video when this worship premiere ends. So if you're on one of our other channels, YouTube or SalemChurch.life, that kind of a thing, just come over to Facebook Live, gather some bread and some juice. I'll meet you there. Uh, it'll likely be a little after 10 o'clock in the morning uh, on, on Sunday when we do that. Next week then is Palm Sunday. We're coming to the end of Lent. Next week is Palm Sunday. And then the week after that, so two weeks from now, is Easter Sunday. That's April 4th. We're very excited about, about uh, sort of the next step in our reentry plans. We will be celebrating Easter worship in person in the parking lot. We'll be doing that at a 645 sunrise service and then at 830 for a, a drive-in. Uh, in addition to our 9.30 online premiere, which we always do. And, and just a couple of uh, words of instruction, that 6.45 sunrise service likely will be smaller, but if you're coming for that, you're welcome to bring a lawn chair. We will invite people to get out of their cars and we'll kind of stand around uh, in the parking lot, or again, if you bring a lawn chair, and uh, we will be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. We'll be offering the sacrament of Holy Communion. 8.30 will likely be a much larger service, and we will do that as a drive-in in the parking lot 
lot. We have an FM transmitter, so you'll be able to drive in and get parked, and we will uh, then transmit our service or broadcast. You'll be listening on your, on your radio. We'll give you the frequency, the FM frequency that you can dial into to listen right in your car, and we'll be offering the sacrament of Holy Communion that day as well. And then I, I'm very excited to tell you this. It, you know, I know I know not everybody hangs around to the very end of our online service, but if you've been hanging around, here you go. I got a little Easter egg, so to speak, a little good news to share with you. Our leadership board has just decided that we will be offering an in-person service in the sanctuary. We will begin that on the last Sunday in April. And uh, details will be in the next newsletter, but we will be coming in for an in-person service and then taking a break for a week and then coming back and then taking a break. And then we'll get back to it every week. We're just going to sort of take it slowly, make sure we're doing it the right way. But I'm very excited to let you know we will be having an in-person service in the sanctuary at the end of April. And we'll continue to have the parking lot uh, service available with our FM transmitter. And we'll continue to be doing this online, of course. All right, I want to invite you to receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.